are with another tutorial and today we are looking at different ways that we can convert our images to black and white and a couple of things to look for when we're trying to enhance um, our black and white images. I just want to make a quick note here that I take no responsibility for the photos that we're using in the tutorial. Um, this is strictly for educational purposes only. Um, however, the techniques um, should be used in class uh, to make your photos better. All right, we're going to start uh, by looking in the folder here for the tutorial. We got Canyon, we got um, Dave's Midnight Sepia, we got Fievel's Gothic Glow. Again, I'm not sure if we're going to use those or not. We got a raw file and we got oldman.jpg. We're going to look at oldman.jpg right now. So just pull that down to Photoshop and let's take a look at that. All right, here's the uh, old man photo. And as you can tell, this is a very, very nicely photographed picture to begin with. Um, it almost looks HDR-ish. It's got a lot of detail and it's, it's really excellent. Um, another thing is that it is a good candidate for black and white because it's got a lot of texture. It's got a good contrast between the dark and the light areas. And so those are qualities that we look for when we are determining what's going to make a good black and white picture. So um, press command zero to enlarge the picture to fill your screen. And we're going to start by converting it to black and white. Now the first most simple way, easiest way to convert to black and white is to go to image mode grayscale. And it'll ask you, do you want to discard the color? And we can discard it. All right. I want you to forget about that method because it doesn't give you any control over how this picture goes to black and white. We're going to undo that. Command Z. We're going to undo that and we're going to go instead to image adjustments black and white. And this time we get a window that pops up that allows us to control how each component of the picture goes to grayscale. So we can adjust the reds for example which would be his uh, part of his skin tone. We can adjust the yellows, which would make up the other chunk of his skin tone. We can adjust the green, which in this case there's not much. The cyan, which would be his eyes. All right, so we can make him look like a zombie if we want by bringing that all the way up, or we can bring it down and have really dark eyes. I'm going to kind of go a little more towards the darker side with his eyes here. Uh, the blue, same deal. His eyes are really blue in the original, and you can see it's also affecting the black in the back. Now I'm going for high contrast here, so I'm going to bring my blacks down quite a bit. Magenta is not going to affect too much. We see a little bit of it in the blacks, but I'm going to go about there. I'm going to hit OK. As you can tell, that allowed me to have way more control over how the image goes to black and white. All right, rather than just saying image grayscale, which uh, Photoshop chooses everything for you, that gave me a lot of control over how it looks. Now, the other thing about black and white images, you want to enhance the details of the shot itself. You don't want to just leave it as is. Um, in this case, we do have a very nice sharp image, and we want to enhance the fact that all those little details of his face are really, really sharp. So we're going to go to Filter, we're going to go to Sharpen, we're going to go to Unsharp Mask. Now the way that Unsharp Mask works, let's just pull this off to the side, is it uh, focuses on the little details of the picture and adjusts the contrast between the pixels that are next to each other, therefore increasing the sharpness of the overall photo. Now this window is very important, the one that pops up here. We can put our mouse inside here and we can move it around. And when we let go, we see the effect added. All right, so I like to go in here and, and tweak it so that it's not overly sharpened, but it's sharpened enough that we're going to see a lot of those little details. Again, I don't like giving exact numbers because what might look good to me 
doesn't necessarily look good to you guys. Um, the amount is how strong you want the effect to be. The radius is how big of an area do you want it to affect. I mean, if you go huge, it's gonna affect giant parts of the picture. If we go just small, it's gonna focus on just the tiny little details of the picture. All right, so finding a balance there is good. Threshold I don't use very often, so we'll just ignore that for now. We're gonna hit OK. And if I hit Command-0, we can see that we've brought out a lot of the little details of the photograph. Next thing here we're gonna look at is how to add a vignette to your photo. And that, in this case, is to hide some of the details on the outside. And so in order to do that, we're going to add a layer. And we're gonna to go to Edit, Fill. We're gonna fill with black. All right, we're gonna add a layer mask, which is down here at the bottom of the layer palette. And you'll notice that our layer splits into two. All right, the left is our original layer. On the right is our mask that we're adding. And I'm gonna talk about masks in a second. Uh, our opacity, we're gonna bring down to 60% so that we can see our image through the black. Now the way that a mask work works in case you haven't used one or if you forgot how they work, um, basically the mask on the right hand side here determines what we can or can't see in the photograph. And when it's all white, we are seeing everything that is on that layer. So it's a black block. However, the opacity has been brought down to six, 60, sorry. Um, and we can see all of that black block because it's all white. If we want to hide parts of that black block, we could go to our paintbrush and using a black foreground color, we can actually hide parts of that black block. Now just a quick shortcut to changing your brush size. On your keyboard there's a P key and to the right of that you got two brackets. Those two brackets determine how big or how small your brush is. Also up at the top here you can make changes to the size of your brush and the hardness of your brush. In this case, we're gonna set our hardness to zero so that we have a really soft edge. Click there just to hide that. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to, oh, also make sure, sorry, that your mode is set to normal, your opacity is 100 and your flow is 100. You don't want any of those changed because that'll affect what happens when you click. Now using the black color of the paintbrush, we are going to paint not by clicking and holding, but just by clicking the parts that we want in this photograph to stand out, which obviously in this case is our subject. Now you can see what I'm doing by clicking is I'm selectively creating a vignette around our subject. And if I hide it, you'll see what I've done. What this does is it draws more attention to our subject. We can also adjust our opacity after so that we eliminate even further some of those details on the outside edge. What this does is it gives your photo a much more professional studio type look to it and it creates a much more, um, a much more, um, well, a much more professional looking black and white photograph in the end. All right, so save this file, go file, save, and save it to your desktop. All right, I'm leaving mine as oldman.psd and just save it, and we're gonna go on to the next one. All right, so we're moving on to a different technique now. We're gonna actually close the old man file, and we're gonna move this out of the way. And now we're gonna look at canyon.jpg. And so we're gonna open that with Photoshop. So drag that to Photoshop. And let's just press Command-0 so it fills the window. All right, so here's a great photo. And uh, as you can tell by National Geographic, um, we are gonna start by converting it to black and white. But before we do that, we're gonna look at actions and we're gonna look at uh, how we can use actions, and we're gonna be talking a lot of, about actions later on the semester. Uh, we're gonna to go to window and we're gonna to go to actions. And that is going to open up this little palette 
somewhere on your screen. So let's just get that showing. Now, in the Actions palette, you're going to look for this little drop down right here in the corner. We're going to click that. And this will give us all the options for our actions. So we're going to go to Load Actions. And we're going to go to um, our folder, which I have here, Wednesday Tutorial. And we're going to open up um, Dave's Midnight Sepia Effect. Dave's Midnight Sepia .atn. ATN tells us that it's an action file. And we're going to hit Open. And nothing changes in here. All right, you don't see anything happen, but in the Actions palette, if you scroll down to the bottom or if you have it stretched all the way down, you'll notice that you have now a Dave's Midnight Sepia action. And we're going to just click this little arrow so we can pull the folder down. You'll see in here Midnight Sepia. Now the cool thing about actions is actions are going to play a predefined set of steps that will create a certain effect to your picture. Now if you do a search for Photoshop actions, you're going to find thousands of actions out there. And the nice thing about actions is you can really quickly get an effect that you may not get um, you know, for a long time by tweaking your color values and so on. Um, with actions you can kind of look at what the effect should look like and, and use that really quickly. So with that one selected we're going to click the play button and you'll notice that it says a message here that I'm not going to read but we're going to just say stop and you'll notice that it really quickly gave this photo kind of a moody sepia effect all right which added kind of a nice look to it now we're going to go to the next step we're going to go to image adjustments black and white and we're going to convert this picture to black and white I forgot an important step so let's just hit cancel the important step I forgot is that we have to flatten our image first. All right, because the Midnight Sepia action added another layer on top, we're going to go to our Layers palette here and to the top right of our Layers palette, same sort of pull down. We're going to say Flatten Image. And that puts everything onto one layer, background layer, and now we're ready to proceed. So we're going to go to image, sorry about that, we're going to go to image adjustments black and white now, once again. And we're going to tweak our sliders to what we think looks good here. Alright, and I'm just kind of playing around again. I don't like giving exact values for what I'm doing here. It really comes down to your personal opinion. And we're going to hit OK. All right, that looks pretty good. All right, so just like our last one, we're going to start creating a vignette, but we're going to do something a little different this time. So we're going to click a new layer. We've got a blank new layer. We're going to go to image, sorry, edit, fill. We're going to fill it with black. We're going to bring our opacity down a bit. Let's say about, let's go down to 60% again. Add our layer mask and this time rather than painting out the middle and leaving our edges um, dark which would give us a true vignette we're going to paint the light back in and this technique is called light painting and so we're just gonna click and just paint in the light where we think it would be breaking through those clouds and coming down this valley all right, now the neat thing about this, and it does take a little bit of practice, is that you can get some really neat effects in your photograph, depending on what your subject is. Rather than just having a plain old boring vignette, one that just blurs out the uh, edges of the picture, now we can control the way that the light enters our photograph. And the cool thing is, again, by adjusting the opacity of that layer, we can also change how intense, okay, or how little that effect actually impacts our photograph. So, again, playing a little bit with where that light falls 
and then adjusting the intensity of the opacity of that layer to adjust how dark that effect is. All right, so that's kind of a neat effect there. So what do we do there? We added a, uh, an action, we adjusted it, went to black and white, and now we added some light painting to it to give us the final effect, which looks pretty cool. So make sure you save that. All right, save it to your desktop. I'm calling it Canyon. And we'll save it and make sure that, yeah, make sure that finishes saving. All right, we're gonna look at one last technique here and um, it's related to raw images. So let's close the Canyon up. All right, let's get rid of that. And so in that uh, tutorial folder, uh, where did I put it here? There it is. We're gonna open up the image called image2512 and you can tell it's a raw file because it's got a .cr2 ending. We're gonna double click that and it should launch the camera raw window. If your camera raw window doesn't come in full screen like this, it might come in like that, you wanna click this little button here, toggle full screen mode or shortcut F and that will put it nicely into full screen mode. Now, hopefully you've used RAW, uh, Camera RAW before, but I am gonna go through some of the settings really quickly here, just as more of a review than anything else. The first thing I like to do as soon as I open up a RAW image is I go to my white balance tool up here. And the white balance tool basically works by you selecting a neutral gray part of the image um, again, remember that white determines what all the other colors in your image will look like. So on her wedding dress here, you can see that it makes minor adjustments and I can kind of click wherever and you'll see how it changes the overall balance. But on the wedding dress, on his, um, his shirt here as well, that's where you're gonna get a nice white balance. All right, now if I was gonna spend more time on this picture, I could also use the crop tool and just crop out these guys on the right who shouldn't be there and then hit return. And that's going to take care of them. Also, because this was for a customer, you know, I wanted the photo to be good. Um, in the original, I actually spent time to take out this mat that had blown with the wind. Um, these are little things to look for before you go any further, but for the tutorial purposes, we're not gonna go into those details. Uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about is the temperature gauge here, temperature slider, and that adjusts the overall color, the, uh, sorry, the white temperature of the photo. And that's what I'm doing by clicking the white balance tool is I'm adjusting that. Now, if I want to manually adjust it, you can see that I can really tweak it to go cooler or warmer just by adjusting it that way. As soon as I click with the white balance tool, it adjusts that for me automatically. The tint, same idea. I can tint the colors to add a bit of an effect as well. Again, I don't use that often. I'm trying to look for a natural here. So I'm gonna click the white again and that'll tweak those both temperature and tints automatically. The exposure is how long the image was exposed for. So how long was that shutter open for? And this is nice with RAW that you can adjust afterwards in case you, you know, didn't have the perfect exposure. Now keep in mind that if you have areas that are blown out, uh, you're not going to be able to bring back detail if it's gone. If it's completely white, it's gone forever. Um, however, areas that are dark, usually there's information still within those areas. So it's better to shoot dark than to shoot too bright. Contrast, how much contrast is between the light and dark areas. So you can see when I pull this up, I get a very almost like Lomo, Lomo-fied look here. Um, or I can bring it down and kind of have more of a natural look to it. Um, if you find that your photo is very flat, like when you pull it all the way down here, you want to bring up your contrast so that it makes it more punchy. Highlights is going to affect the light areas of the photograph. All right, the white areas, the, the bright areas, the highlights. And so you can make your highlights more bright to the point of being overexposed, or you can bring them down so that they're not 
exposed very much at all. And this is a good technique sometimes to recover some of the detail in the white areas. The shadows is the exact opposite. So now it's affecting just the dark areas and you can bring back some of the detail in the shadows. Or you can make your shadows darker if you want to do that as well. So I always like to bring up some of the detail in the shadows. The whites and the blacks work very similar. All right, so the whites are just affecting the, the brightest areas of the photo. It works very similar to highlights. All right, however, there is a difference. It seems to be more of a general adjustment to the whites rather than just the highlight areas. And same with the black. It seems to be more of all the shadow areas just than just the, you know, just the darkest areas. Clarity is how sharp your image is. So if you pull that all the way to the right, you get a very sharp looking image, almost HDR-ish looking. If I pull it all the way to the left, I get a very soft, almost romantic, uh, maybe not in this case, but sometimes you get a very soft looking image. However, I like to bring this up most times. I like my images nice and sharp, especially when I'm just starting to work on my pictures. The vibrance is how vibrant the colors are. So how intense are those colors? Look at that. It is beautiful all of a sudden. It looks like a really summery day, which it was, but those colors are really exaggerated. If I pull this down, I kind of get a muted, uh, desaturated look to the colors. So I do like to bring this up sometimes just to really make those colors pop. Saturation, same sort of idea as vibrance. How saturated how much color does each pixel have so if i crank that it looks really crappy um, because the color is way too intense if i pull it down obviously it's going to go to black and white because i have no color within each pixel so i like to kind of find a balance there as well and we're going to say that that looks pretty good now, the next one here is the tone curve, and we're not going to really adjust that. Um, this is getting into kind of technical with the histogram in the back here. We can adjust the actual tone of the color within, so we'll talk about that later. Uh, the detail, how sharp your image is. So if I crank this up, you see it especially in the leaves on the trees. If I pull it down, there's very little uh, detail to the leaves. If I pull it up, you can see all the little details start to pop. I can bring up my radius so that it's more of a noticeable effect as well. Noise reduction is if we are using a high ISO um, and we want to reduce some of the noise that might be created in the photograph itself. It tries to eliminate that. The next one is the most important one, but we're going to skip it for right now because I want to go through the other ones first and come back to that one. So let's skip HSL grayscale. We're going to go to split toning. Split toning will allow you all sorts of neat effects um, in your shadows and in your highlights. You can uh, split the tones of the image so you can have um, you know, separate color adjustments for both. I don't use it very often. Um, one that is very important is lens correction. And uh, some people may or may not know this, but when you take photos uh, using your lens, uh, you will have some distortion on the outside of the lens due to the curve of the glass. So when somebody might say, I look fat in photographs, um, sometimes they're not exaggerating. It could be the lens that the photographer is using and it has really distorted the, uh, the face of the person. So what you can do here, which is really excellent in RAW, is you can enable the lens correction. So if I click this on, you will see that the edges of the photo kind of uncurl a bit and the middle gets pushed back. This adjusts for the distortion that's created by the lens. Now the cool thing about RAW is that it can automatically tell what lens you were using when you photographed and it adjusts for that particular lens. FX, um, you can purposely add grain so that you can make it look like you had a high ISO. I never use that. I like to keep my pictures looking smooth and, and um, as clean as possible. Vignetting, we looked at that just a little earlier. Now, rather than having to create our own, we can use the slider 
to either create a white vignette or to create a dark vignette to add more um, visual impact to our subjects in the photo. So I'm just gonna pull this down a bit. You can also change things like the midpoint, you know, how small of a midpoint is there, or, or do you want just on the edges? You know, how round is that uh, vignette? Or how oval do you want it to be? How soft a vignette, the feather? All right, so you can make a lot of adjustments here. This is really good for, you know, adding a vignette very quickly and not having to worry about the layer mask method um, so that, you know, just the corners got a little bit of darkness to them. All right, the camera calibration. Again, I don't use this too often, but you can change your camera profile so that you adjust the overall colors for your uh, camera that you're using. All right, you can also go to presets. So this is an important one. Um, if you want to, let's say, uh, create a preset for a bunch of photos that you've taken in the same environment uh, with this particular wedding, you know, um, all the ones that I would have taken after this would have probably been pretty similar adjustments. So I can create a preset here so that for the next picture, all I gotta do is click it and it's set up the same way. The last one is snapshots. All right, I can take a snapshot of the way this is set up and I can go back and change between different setups to see which one I like the best. Let's go back to the most important one, which was HSL grayscale. I'm gonna click that. And at the top, I have an option to convert to grayscale. That's what we're gonna use. I'm gonna click that on and we're gonna lose all of our color. And the nice thing here is we got sliders just like in Photoshop for the black and white. And we can tweak each color within the photograph. So I can adjust the reds and the oranges and the yellows and the greens for the trees. And again, I'm just going along here, tweaking it to what I think looks good. Don't worry about my values, just do it to what you think looks good. All right, and purples, which there won't be much of, and magentas, there's not very much of. And I like that, that looks good to me. So I'm gonna open the image. Now keep in mind when we open the image, it's going to open it into Photoshop, all right? We haven't made any adjustments yet in Photoshop. All the settings we just made were made in RAW, and the cool thing about that is we can go back and undo any of the settings we've made. We can go right back to the original picture. So I'm gonna press Command-0 to fill the screen and take a look at the picture that we're working on here. Now, I wanted to show you one other effect um, that we're gonna to do to this picture. We're gonna to go to our actions like we used earlier, and we're gonna to go to load uh, an action. This time we're gonna load the one called Fivals Gothic Glow, and we're gonna open that up. Inside here, we've got a couple different ones. We got Read First, which just gives instructions. We got General Interest Glow, and we got a COI Glow, which is basically just choosing where you want the interest to be. We're gonna go with General Interest, and we're gonna hit Play. So it's gonna do some, it's gonna say channel mixer's not available, that's okay, because we're in grayscale mode, we're gonna just hit continue. And you'll notice it adds a really soft glow effect to the picture, which is what I was going for. However, the effect is uh, pretty intense. We don't want it that strong. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna press Command A to select our entire window. And then we're gonna go to edit, edit, copy or command C, all right? And you'll notice that that Fivel's Gothic Glow created a second tab. So we're gonna go back to our original tab. We're gonna press command A to select our entire workspace. And we're gonna press command V to put our glow over top of our original. I always do this when I'm adding effects just so that I can add the right amount of effect rather than just going full out. And so what I can do now is because I have the effect sitting on top of the original picture, I can just adjust the opacity of that original layer, sorry, the effect layer, until I like the amount of effect on the original picture. All right, so about there looks good to me. It's not very intense, just adds a bit of a sort of dreamy glow to the picture and it's really nice. I'm just gonna close the actions palette because it's taking up some space here. 
um, on my workspace. Um, last thing we're going to look at is adjusting the overall color of our photograph. Um, some people don't consider this black and white, but I do. Um, sepia tones, for example, some people might know what that means, where you have a brownish sort of tinge to your photo, um, is an example of a duotone color mode. And I believe that that's still considered black and white or, or a two-tone image. Um, so I'm going to show you how to set that up. We're going to go to image mode and you'll notice it's set to grayscale because we set that in raw. Now we're going to go to duotone and in duotone you're probably going to open it up and it's going to have monotone set first. What we can do from this little pull down right here is we can pull it down and choose duotone and by default the colors will be set to black and white. We can click the white chip down here and choose a second color. And now what Photoshop is doing is it's replacing the white with a second color, basically, and it's making tints of that color. So let's say sort of a sepia tone. I can go a little more yellowy, I guess. And I hit OK. An important thing here is that you have to name your color, so I'm going to call it sepia and we can hit OK. Alright, so you can see how we added a really nice effect to our final picture here and uh, really quick and easy. Uh, we added a bit of a glow, we added a vignette, uh, we adjusted it in a raw and now we added a duotone effect. So make sure you save this. Alright, save it to your desktop. We'll call it image 2512, sure save and I think we're done. So what did we learn here? We learned how to use actions, we learned how to light paint, we learned how to use custom vignettes, we learned some of the raw conversion techniques here as well. All right, we looked at sharpening and we looked at, like I said, selectively focusing parts of our image and using glows to kind of add, add an enhanced effect to our pictures. All right, so make sure you save your work and hopefully you got through that okay.